Hi everyone, Professor Nguyen here, and this video lecture is all on chapter two, which is about culture and communication. In this chapter, we are unpacking a lot of commonly used terms, such as culture, race, gender, ethnicity. We're going to figure out the differences between those two. We're going to learn why culture is important to us as communicators. We're also going to learn different strategies for enhancing our communication competence by enhancing our awareness of culture and identity. But before we go to those really big goals, of ours, I really want to start off this part of the video lecture, since this is part one, um, with a really good, strong understanding of why we're doing this. So why are we taking the time to dive so deep into culture for this chapter? Why is our whole chapter devoted to it? And what implications does it have for us as communicators? One of the first things I want to review is the idea of implicit bias. So for those of you who are not aware of what implicit bias is, you can see that there's a definition here from Ohio State University, the Kirwan Institute. They do fantastic work when it comes to implicit bias. Now, you may have heard of the word implicit before. This might be mentioned to you in English classes um, or in other argumentation uh, classes where the word implicit refers to things that are not overt, they're not obvious, they're not things that we know about. So in other words, an implicit bias is a belief or attitude or stereotype that you hold about a group of people that you're not aware of, um, that you don't know that is deep in your subconscious. So that's the concept of implicit, meaning that you don't know that it's there. All human beings, no matter where they came from, no matter where they grew up, no matter who they are, have implicit bias. I have implicit bias, you have implicit bias, we all have implicit bias, as, um, you get a bias and you get a bias. So what that really means for us here is that I am specifically referring to implicit bias here at the beginning of this lecture to try to call attention to the importance of self-awareness as we enter into conversations about race, gender, and identity. The reason being is because we all have not grown up in a vacuum, right? We've all grown up with other people, we've grown up in unique unique communities, we've grown up in unique families, and we, while we all share a lot of the same experiences, so for example, those of you who grew up in Southern California, we might have a lot of shared experience together because I also grew up in Southern California. However, we all also share a lot of important differences, a lot of which are enhanced by our sense of identity. So because of that, it's important to be aware of our implicit biases because they are a product of all the information that we have uniquely been exposed to for the whole of our lives. So for example, you may have, and this is quite common, an implicit bias where you associate positiveness, so beauty or any other positive ideas with having a thinner body, right? Um, that might not be something that you overtly discriminate against. Um, let's say you meet someone that is um, a bigger body person, you might not necessarily discriminate against them overtly. However, that implicit bias is still there in you. Where did that come from? It most likely came from media, especially social media nowadays, depicting that being thinner or having a very particular body type is associated with beauty, is associated with positive things. So that's the example of what an implicit bias is. It's something that we've learned over time, either from our family, our community, the people we hang out with, our work colleagues, or just media in general, the media that we consume or don't consume, really shape and frame our implicit biases against other people. The reason being that implicit bias is important is that it's impossible to avoid. Why is this so? It's impossible to have bias because our brain's ability to perceive anything that is objective is a myth. We're human beings. We're already subjective creatures as it is. There's no way that we could view our reality as objective all the time. So therefore, everything that's in your brain, everything you use to perceive the world, which we'll get more to in chapter four, um, so bookmark this idea, everything is influenced by our past experiences. One example is this. A lot of people tend to think, oh, if I have bias, that means I'm a bad person. That's not necessarily so. We all have implicit bias. The reason being is because it's part of the way our brain makes sense of the world. We are hardwired um, to categorize things and categorize our experiences. So one example might be, let's say you're young and you are five years old, you touch the stove um, and it's very hot and you burn your hand. And you're like, ooh, I don't like that. I'm not gonna do that again. Let's say the next day you go to the beach and there's a fire there. 
you know not to touch that fire now because you've just had a really bad experience touching the stove, right? But think about it. The stove and a fire at the beach don't necessarily look the same, but you've been able to associate or stereotype that experience with the fire to help you survive, right? Um, so now you know it's not just stoves, but anything that relates to heat, I shouldn't touch it. So that's an example of how our brain just automatically categorizes things, right, in order to help us survive and kind of navigate through this world. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that we do that. However, it is detrimental to our communication if we're not aware of how that categorization applies to people. Because guess what? No matter what, fire is going to be fire, right? Fire is always going to be hot. Fire is always going to be a possible source of danger, right? And so we can categorize fire in that way, and it makes sense. However, people are complicated. People have a lot of different factors to them. So it's hard and difficult and actually really detrimental to us as human beings if we start categorizing other human beings who have the capability to change, who are complicated, the same way that we would categorize fire. Does that make sense? So we can't objectify human beings that way. Um, so that's why we have to become hyper aware of the implicit biases that we have internalized. They are very, very pervasive. So even people like judges who try to stay as objective as possible when they're judging um, a case can still be um, sub subjective in a lot of different ways. Um, that's why, for example, our criminal justice system doesn't necessarily always reflect fairness and equality and equity for all of the people that um, have to go through the criminal justice system because our system, because it's objective, doesn't necessarily treat everybody the same. However, remember that implicit bias is something that once you're aware of it, you can confront it and unlearn it. So it's not like you're stuck with implicit bias forever. Um, we are able to mitigate or kind of stop the bad effects of having implicit biases if we just self-reflect and are aware of them. One of the things that is generally pretty interesting for me and like I put here for you to review is that we generally tend to hold positive or are in favor of um, implicit biases that favor our own group. So for example, we might think that people our age are more interesting or more fun and exciting, right? Um, we might have negative biases against people that are different age groups than us. Um, and one of the ways that we can mitigate that or kind of fight against that urge is to expose ourselves to different types of people with different ages, right? And so implicit biases, therefore, are malleable, meaning they're flexible. They can change and grow over time, and we can unlearn them just as we have learned them. One thing I will warn you on, though, is that implicit biases, because they're implicit, meaning they're in your subconscious, right? You're not aware that you have them. Because of that reason, they may contradict what you publicly believe. So going back to my example of maybe having an implicit bias against those who have larger body types or different body types that are not the norm for what our beauty standards are here in America. One of my students um, so bravely shared one day in class, and she has given me permission to share this story. Um, she actually um, has uh, uh, tested in the IAT, which is the Implicit Association Test, which is what I'm going to have you all do as an assignment for this uh for this module for this chapter. When she took the Implicit Association Test, which is a test that um, basically tests you for implicit biases in different categories, she decided to take the weight one because she was someone that um, always struggled with her weight, was bullied for um, being a, a larger bodied woman, and so therefore she struggled a lot with being um, bullied for that. And so she decided to take the weight implicit association test. She had hoped that she would test that she would have a positive association with people who have bigger bodies. However, she actually tested to demonstrate that she prefers people or has more positive perceptions of people with thinner bodies and she was shocked by this and after further self-reflection she realized that that deeply ingrained idea that thinner bodies are better is something that isn't something she created but something that she learned through many many years of seeing only thinner bodies widely represented in the media and widely favored when it comes to everyday conversation and so because of that even though she explicitly meaning she consciously believes that 
all people and all bodies are beautiful, she still held the implicit bias of being of preferring thinner bodies or associating thinner bodies with beauty or with more positive value. So that's an example of how our implicit biases don't necessarily always line up with what we actually explicitly believe, which is why it's even more important that we interrogate these implicit biases and really self-reflect on where we learn them from. From More often than not, these implicit biases have been socialized in us over time, and it's important for us to confront them so that we're aware of them and they don't affect our communication. Now that we've taken a look at implicit bias and how we all have it, um, I want you to now orient your mind into understanding what culture is, how we have developed culture as human beings, and how it really links to what our chapter is talking about here. Please remember that since we all have implicit bias, don't feel like you're a bad person if you test in the IAT and it shows that you have an implicit bias that's negative toward a particular group of people. That's totally okay. If anything, I want you to confront those ideas so you can self-reflect on where you learn them from and ultimately negotiate them so that they aren't staying permanently as implicit biases in your head. Make sense? All right, let's get to what culture is. The word culture, I think, is thrown out a lot in everyday conversation, and I really want to ground us in the social scientific definition of it, the definition I will be using for our course, and of course, the definition that our textbook authors talk about here. Um, Samovar is a fantastic researcher, and the definition that I love to use comes from Samovar, and culture is really the language, values, beliefs, traditions, and customs that people share and learn. And I want to kind of highlight two key words in that definition, share and learn. <laughs> so the word share indicates that culture cannot exist without people. People create culture, people practice culture. You see it in everyday rituals, and you also see it in rituals that we celebrate as holidays. Um, you also see that culture is learned, meaning that no human being is naturally born, right, um, with this sense of what their culture is. Um, culture, therefore, is something that is learned in a given environment of who you, where you grew up as a human being and what people surrounded you and how, what culture they shared and what culture they imparted upon you. Culture is bound then by perception and definition. And what that means is that because culture is something human beings created, it can only exist insofar as much as people perceive it right and that people define it so in other words culture is a social construct it is something that human beings created if you're reading my slide right here you should read it from top to bottom so you can see that i broke down that definition and why it was important by continuing to kind of funnel down into more deeper ideas here so since we know that culture is something that is shared and learned therefore it can only exist by how much people actually perceive it and define it so therefore it's created by people Boom, boom, boom. So now that we know this definition, why is that important to us? Or why does that matter to us? And one of the key things that I always highlight is look at who we are as a species, right? As human beings, we have learned to dominate this planet in a way that other animals have not been able to dominate this planet correct? Um, and one of the key reasons for that is because of culture. Culture brought us together to share values, ideas, norms, practices, behaviors, principles, things for us to aspire to as a society. And when I say culture, I mean all cultures, right? All human beings, when we share culture, we can come together as communities and build things that are bigger than each individual person. That's why we've really ballooned into the species that we are on this planet because of our capacity for language, our enhanced brains, and our our sharing of culture, right? And how that has unified communities historically through time. Um, if you want to know more about that, read a book that I'm currently reading that I absolutely love called Sapiens. Um, and it really kind of knocks down a lot of those ideas and really does a great history of humanity and how we created a lot of thriving communities held together by culture. Now as a human being, as I said before, we're complicated. So we typically do not just share only one culture in our lives. We experience a lot of different cultures. And especially in a place like America, you are more likely to experience a variety of different cultures than you may in other areas or other countries because of the diverse makeup of our population, especially here in Southern California, for those of you who live here. 
So let's talk a little bit about then how that connects to communication, how we've learned to share culture, and the various types of cultures that we might be a part of. So here in our class, we're studying interpersonal communication, which is communication between people. It uh, usually impairs, not groups, and it focuses on the idea of how we create relationships with one another based off interpersonal interactions. A part of interpersonal interactions is intercultural, meaning that more often than not, you're going to meet someone that is different from you, either in age, race, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, all of the above. Um, and so when you meet anyone with those types of differences, you may be engaging in intercultural communication as well. Meaning, you may be engaging in a process where two, uh, you and the other person um, are exchanging messages in a way that your culture actually impacts the interaction, right? Um, so what that really means is anytime you're meeting someone that is different from you or shares a different cultural identity than you, and your conversation is impacted by those differences, positively or negatively, um, you're engaging in intercultural communication, communication between people of two different cultures. Um, why is this important or why do we need to know about it? We can't really become competent interpersonal communicators if we can't build relationships with all individuals, including those that may come from different cultures than us. And Therefore, it's really important that we're mindful of these uh, differences that we may interact with other people um, and, and be mindful of the strategies we're using in communicating with them. However, interestingly enough, I wanted to tap this tidbit right here. Two researcher, uh, researchers, Agudikunz and Kim, they talked about this idea that after a while, when you've built an interpersonal relationship with someone, the intercultural or the cultural weight, right? Um, the cultural differences starts to dissipate. Let me give you an example. When I was young, I bounced around at a lot of different schools, but I primarily grew up in the Los Angeles area. I went to a school and lived in a community where there were not um, a lot of other Asian individuals around. And so a lot of my good friends and a lot of the people that I knew in my community were um, Latino and Latina. Specifically, they were of Mexican descent. Um, those are the people that I associated the most with as a young child. And I actually picked up Spanish from them before I picked up English in school when I immigrated here. One of the key um, kind of great experiences that I had growing up was I had a neighbor and her name was Balia and she was an older woman, she was in her 70s at the time, and she was always so kind to me and my mother. Uh, my mother was a single mom and you know, was going to community college and trying to work two full-time jobs to take care of me and my brother. And so oftentimes she couldn't afford a babysitter but needed one because she always had to work or go to school. So my neighbor, Belia, I used to call her abuela, which means grandma in Spanish, for those of you who don't know, abuelita she would basically come over and babysit, you know, and really help out our family in that way. And I learned a lot through her. And one of the most awesome things that I have ever seen was how she was able to develop a very close and personal friendship with my mother, um, even though neither of them spoke English at the time. <laughs> and of course, my mother couldn't speak Spanish and she couldn't speak Vietnamese. So I have no idea how they communicated with one another. That's an example of an intercultural interaction where two people coming from very different cultures um, are, are trying to communicate, but the differences of their cultures are presenting some really unique challenges to those interactions however because they were really motivated and because they really wanted to get to know each other and develop that strong bond they were able to develop an interpersonal relationship which ultimately outweighed a lot of those cultural differences so even though they had different languages different worldviews different religions and different life experiences they ended up becoming great friends because they constantly kept at it and constantly tried to build that interpersonal relationship what this lesson tells us here from Goody Kunst and Kim is that if we are constantly motivated and try hard enough to fight through the weight or the salience of a variety of different cultural factors in an interaction and we build a relationship with someone, we can overcome a lot of the cultural differences or challenges that we might have. Not to say that cultural differences are not important or valid, but we develop relationships with people and they become more intimate because we are putting in the effort to try to mitigate a lot of the cultural differences that we have in that interaction. I'll always remember that 
um, they had lunch together one day and my mother showed my abuela how to roll something with rice paper and my abuela showed my mom what a tortilla is um, remember I was born years so y'all I, I didn't know what a tortilla was until I came here to the States and my abuela showed me um, and they would kind of sh exchange recipes and that was really their anchor point um, as two amazing women of a household on how to connect with one another and so even though they couldn't speak the same language and came from very different worldviews where their nonverbal cues were even different they developed a very close and intimate relationship and that's what Goody Kunst and Kim is reminding us of here so let's talk about all the different types of groups you can be in um, now as I said before usually human beings are not just part of one culture <laughs> we're part of a lot of different cultures and a variety of them so the cultures that we are part of are called in groups the ones that we are not a part of are called out groups because of course if you are in a group you sometimes by definition are not in another group um, so those are out groups and the social identity is the part of your self-concept or your identity that is based off your group membership okay we'll get to the self-concept in the next chapter chapter three so don't worry about that we'll get there um, but really what this is talking about is that we all have in groups Sometimes our in-groups are voluntary, meaning we choose to be part of them. I chose to become an educator. I chose to become a teacher. And so being a teacher in that community of educating is part of my in-group. However, I didn't really choose to be born a woman or choose to um, uh, be born Vietnamese, right? And so a part of that, uh, my in-groups are not voluntary, meaning that I see myself as a Vietnamese immigrant that's an in-group of mine that is not voluntary, meaning that it's just a part of who I am because of my life experience. An out-group, therefore, are groups that we view as different. And so this, um, this refers to this idea that groups that uh, when we're looking at other people and examining their experiences, if we can't really connect to their experience, most of the time that means we're an outgroup of them. So, for example, a lot of individuals that have immigrated here have this shared experience of being an immigrant. If you were a natural born citizen in the United States, you might see immigrants as an outgroup because you see them as different, right? Um, because of the way that they came to the States or their process, right, of coming to live in the United States. Outgroups are something that we have to be mindful of because it's not, again, just like implicit biases, we all have outgroups. We can't all be part of every group, right? Um, as a person that does not have a disability, I am, I, Persons with disabilities are part of one of my outgroups, right? That's just kind of naturally how it works. But because of that, I have to be mindful of it and remember that since they're an outgroup, I should be more respectful and empathetic when I'm speaking with them because a person with a disability, since they're an outgroup for me, I will never know what it's like to live with a disability. So therefore, I make sure to change my communication and be more mindful, listen more, and value them more, and make sure I practice empathy um, and be supportive when I'm speaking to those who are um, who are persons with disabilities. So that's a personal example of mine. Uh, think about the outgroups that you are not a part of and how you may never experience what those outgroups experience. However, how can you use your communication maybe to understand a little bit more about them? Social identity is really important um, because we, again, don't live in a vacuum. We all are part of different communities. Um, you may be part of a religious community, a, um, a literal physical community, right? So here I live in Long Beach and I love my Long Beach community. Um, you may be part of a variety of different communicator communities. And so because of that, a part of your self-concept um, is, is extracted from your membership in that group right so social identity therefore refers to this idea that the groups that we are a part of help to define our own personal identities right we are products of our environment even though we are all unique individuals with our own personalities and our own world experiences because we don't live alone and we live with other people whether in big communities or small communities a part of our identity is going to naturally come from or stem from the membership that we have in different groups Cold cultures refer to um, different smaller, I, I like to think of them as kind of like subcultures within a culture. Um, so in the United States, we have, you know, this kind of American culture as a whole. But even within the United States, we have a lot of different cultural communities that are incredibly unique, vibrant and thriving. Cold cultures involve this idea that 
you can be part of this bigger, wider community, uh, this bigger, wider culture, and you can also share a lot of other different group memberships. So for example, I see myself as belonging to the wider culture of being an American, right? And being part of American culture. I listen to American music, right? And consume American media. And in a lot of ways, I'm an Ameri- I am practice American culture through that media that I consume, the way that I'm speaking right now, and the clothes that I wear. However, I also belong to a lot of different co-cultures, such as being Vietnamese. I also belong to the co-culture of being an immigrant, and I also belong to the co-culture of being an educator, like I said before. So you can kind of share a lot of other memberships beyond just the over-encompassing cultural membership that you have based off the area or country that you live in. So with that being said, I hope that this lecture helps you helped you get a better idea of why we're doing uh, why we're studying this, why we're taking the time to examine culture. Um, I hope that learning about implicit bias has shed some light into how we all carry different ideas and values about other groups of people and how we can kind of manage those identities and those ideas by being aware of our implicit biases. We've also reviewed in this video the definition of culture and what it means and why it's important and ultimately why culture is such a uniquely human process and why it should be celebrated for that reason. In the next video, we're going to dive even deeper using these foundations to understand cultural values and race, gender, and identity. See you all soon. Bye.